Welcome everyone to uh, the University of Notre Dame. Uh, this is actually our third season of live chats and this will be our first episode uh, beginning the third season. Something that began accidentally uh, as COVID uh, uh, started and, uh, and I wanna thank all of you for participating, taking time out of your busy schedules and we've continued this because uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback that you find it meaningful and uh, we really appreciate uh, you participating in, in these uh, live chats. It's an absolutely gorgeous day on campus. It's uh, sunny, it's in uh, the mid to high 70s, and you're beginning to feel a little buzz on campus. I walked into work today, and you can just see a bustle of, uh, of activity beginning. Some cars arriving, more students walking to campus. It will begin much more robustly next week as students start to move in the band and and the RAs and others to kind of prepare uh, for students to come back. The first day of class, classes will be Tuesday, um, August 23rd. They're also furiously trying to complete uh, some, some minor construction projects here on campus. Uh, uh, there's a new entrance to the main gate of campus and there's expanded parking uh, that have been, that's been put in by the bookstore and a new set of bookstore basketball courts that will be received very well by our students in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're putting in uh, the, the, this uh, World Peace Plaza uh, that will have a new fountain uh, right next to the grotto and adjacent to St. Mary's Lake. And that's gonna be beautiful when you come back uh, this fall for games. Soren Hall has been uh, renovated and an addition has been put onto it, which is spectacular with the old brick from Corby Hall. You cannot even tell uh, that an addition has been put on uh, with a consistency of the brick. And, uh, and that has been shut down for 14 years and that is now reopening to students. This year, Alumni Hall is offline and those students are living uh, uh, currently in, uh, in, uh, in another dorm on campus and, and they will uh, for 14 months be be redoing Alumni Hall and adding a little bit onto that. So a lot of activity on campus. Can't wait for you to be back this fall. And uh, one of the reasons why you'll be coming back will be because I imagine football games. Um, a great opportunity to gather the Notre Dame family uh, to take in a, a wonderful football program, but more than that, uh, to walk the lake, lakes, uh, to visit the grotto, uh, to go to mass after the game and to reconvene with members of the Notre Dame family. And to that end, who better to start off uh, these live chats than our uh, Vice President and James E. Rohr, Director of Athletics at Notre Dame, uh, Jack Swarbrick. He is beginning his 15th year as an athletic director at Notre Dame. He is the fifth longest serving athletic director at one school in the country right now. And we are very blessed and probably will rely on his formidable skills and experience more than ever in, uh, in the next year or two. So we're really privileged to have him with, uh, with us. He's in Chicago joining us. He's about to go into an advisory council meeting uh, for uh, the student athlete uh, this afternoon. Jack, thanks for being with us. Hey, it's great. It's great to be with you. Thanks for that introduction. It made me feel very old. <laughs> Well, you know, you've only got 20 years to go uh, to catch up with Father Ted. And uh, we'll be, you know, rolling you out uh, in a wheelchair for one of those interviews 20 years from now. Well, in my case, it's trying to catch up to Moose. Oh, what was, what was Moose's tenure? Oh, I get it wrong. It was in the 30s. It was in the 30s. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> that's, not hap that's not happening. <laughs> so before we get into all of the the really the pressing and urgent uh, issues that you're dealing with um, as a ramification of all the dynamics in college athletics. Let's just pause briefly to reflect on what was an extraordinary fall, I should say spring for Notre Dame sports. Really this past uh, academic year uh, was a year that many uh, sports, different teams shined. Uh, any highlights that you'd like to, uh, to touch on? before we move forward? Well, it was a great year, Lou. And, and for me, probably the greatest satisfaction is the number of sports that had really good years. Um, 
that was reflected in our high finish, number eight in the Director's Cup, but we also won the Capital One Cup for the best overall men's program in the country. Is, that's um, got to be a first time that we've that's ever happened. Is that correct, Jack? It's actually the second. Second, but, okay. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we don't focus on either, but if I have to win one, I'd rather win the Capital One Cup. It comes with a cash reward for our programs. So uh, right. a, little, a little gift for them. But, you know, it started with cross country, both teams finishing in the top 10 in the country, women finishing fifth. Uh, they, they had a remarkable final championship meet uh, down in Florida. Um, so you start with those two teams. Of course, football had a great season. Mm -hmm. um, some unexpected developments at the end of it, but uh, came off a, a, another really special season. We got into the winter, and I was uh, – this is the first time ever in my time here. We, we often have all three winter sports, basket, both basketballs and hockey, qualify for the NCAA tournament. This was the first time ever, though, that none of the games overlapped. They, wow. were, they were all on separate days. So not to bore your audience, but I went on consecutive days. I went from South Bend to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City to San Diego, San Diego to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City to San Diego, San Diego to South Bend, South Bend to New York, New York to Connecticut, Connecticut to Albany, Albany back to Connecticut, Connecticut back to Albany, and then finally home. I wanted to talk to you about uh, some of those frequent flyer miles. Yeah, I wish. You know, <laughs> when you're trying to get to those cities, yeah. uh, the, the frequent flyer miles go, go out the window. But yeah. so that was a great winter. And then we headed into a spring um, where we just had some special performances across many of our sports, but marked mainly by baseball's uh, remarkable run. Uh, so inspirational uh, yeah. to, get, to get to Omaha. I'm not sure I've, I've been in an environment that was more fun um, to win in than in Knoxville against the number one team in the country, yeah. uh, playing, playing three games down there. So I, I appreciate you asking the question because in so many ways, and I've only touched on a few of them, it was a very special year. Yeah, I mean, it's quite extraordinary across the board uh, to finish eighth in uh, in 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 the, uh, I always they change the names, the Director's Cup, yeah. Director's Cup, as they call it now. And and then, you know, number one for men's sports and Capital One. It's that, that is extraordinary because the, the, usually the teams that want to win it have many more sports and in different areas. So for us to kind of, we're kind of punching above our weight there with the number of sports we have. So congrats to you and all the teams. Oh, it's, it's, the, it's the remarkable student athletes and coaches. The AD doesn't, uh, that doesn't contribute much to those victories. Well, let me tell you, it, it, it you do. And in fact, it goes to, we're going to talk more about Marcus in a little bit, but let's talk about some of the other head coaches that you've hired in this past year. And it looks like you've brought in, you know, at least three new um, additional uh, coaches that are just going to be terrific for their programs. Could you say a word about each? Yeah, sure. And, and let me start with just a comment about, sort of the dynamic that causes that to happen. It's those are always hard decisions to make a change yeah. um, because the people who work at Notre Dame and coach here are fantastic. But my obligation to our student athletes is to give them a chance to maximize their success mm -hmm. uh, both on and off the, the playing field. So you make those tough decisions when you think we can be better and, and make our commitment a, a better job of meeting our commitment to our student athletes. So we had to do that across some of our sports. So let me ask you this before, before we get into the specifics, you know, change can happen at any minute across your 26 sports, right? And there's a lot of movement in, in the coaching positions. Do you have like lists built for every sport that, that if, and when it happens, you have a list that you know you can go to. How, how do you prepare for this? Yeah, never. I, I, I work really hard to make sure I don't have a list. Okay. Because what I have found is each hire has its own dynamic. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what we try and be really rigorous about is having the discipline to start the search by saying, what are the characteristics that the next coach needs to have? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're looking for a program builder. 
Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're looking for somebody who's especially good at recruiting. Sometimes you're looking at somebody whose who's game strategy is distinguishable. Mm -hmm. it, it just changes from search to search. And if you start with the candidate pool, you get blinded by it. Oh, yeah. so-and-so is eligible? That's great. You know, or is it interested? That's great. And so we don't, we won't even have a discussion. I won't let somebody raise a coach's name, prospective coach's name, until we've gone through that process of really talking about what should they look like? What are the characteristics? Yeah, that's a fascinating discipline. And once again, it it shows that I ask stupid questions. But uh, but I love I love the approach. Yeah, it's and hardly a stupid question. And the one thing I'll add to that is, I think our audience would be shocked at who I hear from when Notre Dame has an offer, an opening. Yeah. Um, it, it's just unbelievable, especially if, when you get one in football. But uh, you'll, you'll hear from United States senators and CEOs of Fortune 200 companies and all who have somebody that you need to talk to, right? They've, right, got, right. they've got somebody who's a perfect fit at Notre Dame. And so those are, those are interesting times. Sure. So tell us about some of the hires that you made this past year. Well, um, I'll, I'll sort of work in reverse. So we just made a hire in, in baseball uh, very recently um, with, with Sean Stifler. And um, that was a very interesting process uh, because obviously the program was coming off a special year. Um, Coach Jarrett had done an amazing job and his decision to go back home was a compelling one. I mean, when, hmm. when he and I met and he explained what he was thinking about, um, I said, well, then there's no discussion here about what, what we can do for you. Let's just talk about the transition because he felt an obligation to go home and help his parents. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what we want Notre Dame people to do. And that's mm -hmm. how we want them to think. So we conducted a national search had a pool of about 50 initially, um, whittled it down to about a dozen that we engaged with and scrubbed pretty hard, and then had three finalists. Mm -hmm. And and Sean, Sean emerged, and, and it was probably as sort of convincing an emergence as I've had in, in a mm -hmm. coach search, right? I mean, it was, he, he, he was never sort of, oh, this is the guy until he got to campus and we had the interviews and he was the guy for everybody. Yeah. Um, and so he's going to be great. I've said it during the press conference. But one of the things that struck me the most as we talked to people around the country about him was they said, you know, his teams look a lot like Notre Dame teams. Hmm. And uh, we have, we've come to learn his values are a lot like Notre Dame's values. Um, Chris Lindauer, our new head of our swimming program, um, is a, just a ball of energy. Came from a very successful program at Louisville. Um, relatively young coach who again separated himself in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a feel for the place and, a, and an approach to how he's going to build a successful program at Notre Dame that was pretty exciting for us. He's brought in a very talented staff, very, very accomplished former student athletes who have become very successful coaches. And so our team, our team couldn't, couldn't be more excited about that. I should also mention in golf, we made a change in that we, we elevated um, John Handrigan to the director of all golf, mm -hmm. just the head coach of men's when we had an opening in the women's side. And then, and then he filled that. Um, and then, and then finally the volleyball search um, where we had this. This one was a little different, and mm -hmm. then we conducted a national search, and all the t all the while, we had an ideal candidate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times Salima said no to us. Made me feel like I was back in high school trying to get a date. Um, <laughs> but we we just kept asking and and pursuing because it was so clear to us that she was the best possible coach for Notre Dame. And she is a dynamo. She yeah. is, she has brought an energy to the program. Um, it'll take a while to turn it around because the timetable and recruiting in that sport is so long. Right. But I've never had more confidence in a hire than I do in her. 
Yeah, she was a national champion, right? At, uh, as a player at Penn State and coached. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I had the chance to meet her with you at, uh, you brought her to the uh, bowl game in Tempe, Arizona, right? As part of that recruitment. Well, it's a great story because that was a convenient place for us to interview, sort of distance wise from, she was in Austin, Texas. And so we said, look, we're gonna be in Arizona. Why don't you come talk to us there? And uh, I interviewed with her the day before the game, and I said, you know, it's silly to be here and not go to the football game. You ought to stay. I mean, she, she didn't come prepared to stay overnight, right? I mean, she was just and, – and she said, oh, that's – that that I'm not going to do that. She said, that's silly. And I showed up at the game the next day, and she was there, and I said, all right, we're going we're gonna to get her. Yeah. Fantastic. That was a great, great recruiting tool. So, so talk a little bit about – what do you expect from the teams this fall? Um, you know, you have both soccer programs uh, coming off a, a really strong year last year. Men's made it to the final four. Um, so what are you, are you feeling particularly bullish about any team? We'll talk football later. You know, I feel bullish sort of across the board, mm -hmm. you know, and I, the danger of my answering your first question is that I didn't highlight men's soccer among some other sports. Yeah. A great run to the final, to the College Cup, their final four. Um, I think both programs have a great trajectory right now, both soccer programs. Um, you know, relatively newer coaches at Notre Dame um, who have been able to build the programs the way they want them, a really high level of talent. So, you know, it's such a crazy sport, a bad bounce here or there, and your fortunes change completely. But I, I think most people believe the men will be one of the teams competing again to be the national champion. Mm -hmm. And the women are right on the cusp of that. Mm -hmm. Nate has done a good job of making them more athletic. Cross-country teams come off a year of great success, and I expect them to be very good again. There was a lot of youth on our, on our teams. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we lose some really talented runners like Yared, but um, – I, I look for both both cross country teams uh, to be very good again uh, this year. And then the volleyball, volleyball and hockey have the world's longest seasons. Uh, volleyball is starting up. Uh, had their mm -hmm. first practices yesterday, and again, it's a build, but you're going to see a different a different type of team. Um, and and I hope our fans will come out and support them. We really need to build the crowd for volleyball. Yeah, that's that's exciting uh, on the verge of all these sports starting up again. So let's talk a little bit about the, the elephant in the room, uh, conference affiliation. Uh, there's been a lot of movement on this front, and I think to, to the average fan pretty much anywhere in the country, it's been a bit dizzy. Not only what happened so swiftly and happened behind closed doors, um, major conference shifts, but what still might be happening behind closed doors and, and when is the next shoe to, to fall? Tell us a little bit about what you see in the landscape and, and what are the ramifications for Notre Dame? You know, the two big moves we've had in the past two years um, were in a sense foreseeable. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us knew that Texas was, interested in considering what his options might be. And a lot of us knew that USC was a little frustrated with its situation. Mm -hmm. So those two dominoes you always felt were sort of potential movement. Now, did I see USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten? No, not necessarily, but mm -hmm. the, the, the movement didn't surprise it. But, but those are the big moves, right? Those are the tectonic ones. Yeah. And then they, they, they trigger other discussions and other possibilities. Um, you know, I think what we've seen now is the consolidation of power, if you will, in two conferences, mm -hmm. the SEC and the Big Ten. So there's a bit of a big two, next level three, and then group of five in a way there, there wasn't prior to this. Or, or, or won't be when the moves are completed. They, have, they don't happen yet. And so that's probably the biggest significance, I think, that the SEC and the Big Ten have at least for now put themselves in a different position. Do you think there could be a consolidation of a third 
do you think there could be some configuration of the ACC and the you know the the what's left of the Pac-10? Could could there be a third conference that emerges soon, or do you just see the the, the big two? Um, there are a lot of complications to creating a third. Um, you know the the ACC has looked at a lot of options. Obviously, the Pac-12 and the Big 12 have looked at every option. I, I think the notion of a consolidation um, would make some sense. I think it's really complicated to get to. Mm -hmm. and, and absent some merger by the Big 12 and Pac-12, I, I think it's, at least in the near term, unlikely. Mm -hmm. So I think the advantage and it's an advantage that sort of gets reinforced with their media deals. The advantage that the SEC and the Big Ten have built um, is probably going to be there for quite some time. Interesting. Interesting. What are the ramifications in, 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 you know, of the conference uh, affiliation? We'll talk television and media contracts a little bit in, in just a bit. But what are the ramifications for Notre Dame? I, if, do you think we've come out of this? in a stronger position, given all of the discussion? Or Notre, Notre Dame seems to be in the epicenter of all these discussions. Yeah, I don't know if we're stronger, but it certainly has felt like a validation of our decision to be independent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, so many, so many of the commentaries, so many of the stories have been, you know, what will Notre Dame do? Yeah. Um, and discussing Notre Dame's significance and the importance if we made a decision to do one thing or another. So it, it, when I started this job, and I, I don't say that to, to take any credit for it, but all, this, all the commentary was, were we relevant anymore? Mm -hmm. in, in, in this year, no one's asking that question. And I think all of this dynamic has just reinforced that a lot of the decisions that have been made over the years have placed Notre Dame in a very good position. And, and, and that's my biggest takeaway. So it seems that through this whole process that, especially on the football front, the NCAA, um, its position has just grown, you know, kind of weaker uh, along the way. Uh, do you see, are we headed toward a, a college football super league of like 60 schools and so forth that will form its own uh, set of governance what are the tectonic shifts on that front? Yeah, there are really two different concepts there. Um, as, as to a super league, it feels unlikely. Um, mm -hmm. Just too complicated with contractual commitments and assignment of rights and mm -hmm. a number of things. So I think you'll, you'll have the SEC and the Big Ten, um, as I say, sort of carving out their own space. They will likely grow a little bit over time. I don't think there's anything imminent, but it wouldn't surprise me to see both of those eventually wind up around 20. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you, your question earlier went to, maybe over a longer period of time, there'll be a, the emergence of a third, which sort of gets you to that number of 60 that, mm -hmm. that, that have positioned themselves. Separate from that is the issue of governance. And there's a lot of discussion today about how should football be governed? What's the role of the NCAA? Should football, should the, should the college football playoff be the organization that does it? Should we create something new? Should more power shift to the conferences? Um, there's, there is a general view that something new has to, has to take shape here to effectively govern football, which, you know, has, has a position now, which I don't think any of us could have anticipated as recently as 10 years ago. It, mm -hmm. Its dominance is extraordinary. Now, Notre Dame football has remained independent for roughly 135 years. What would trigger any move for Notre Dame to kind of give up its football independence? And what what is the timeline? Uh, give us a sense of a timeline for those triggers or those decisions to be made. Yeah, um, you know, we've talked about them a fair amount. One is, do we have a committed broadcast partner who not only will carry all our games, all our home games nationally, but will uh, compensate us for our media rights in a way that allows us to be competitive? So it, 
it starts with the question of media partner. Secondly, is our access to the college football playoff. Mm -hmm. Um, Do we, as an independent, retain adequate access? I think we've proved conclusively in the past eight years that that, that we've had it. Mm -hmm. Um, Both those things will play out over time. I can't predict how much time. Um, You think it's like one to two years? You know, I think the CFP will be resolved as to what's next within that time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, it's possible that the media situation could be, um, but the flip side of that is our contract runs through the 25 season. Right. So hard, hard to say, but those are the first two things. The third is a, a good home for our Olympic sports where mm-hmm. they can compete for national championships, um, but also have schedules that sort of make sense for them. And, um, the ACC has been a great partner for us in that regard. I'd like to make progress on the schedule front. It's it's so hard for our kids to travel, yeah, um, the way they do. You know, I think we've talked about it before. But when you're going to Tallahassee, and you start with a bus trip to Midway, and then you connect once along the way before you get there, and then you're on a bus trying to get to campus, it's probably 18, 16 hours. Yeah that you've been involved in traveling, that's tough to be a pre-med major or a finance major right. and, uh, and do that. So we're always looking for ways to make the scheduling easier. But it's, it's, it's media, it's CFP, and it's our Olympic sports. Great. And uh, how about the recent announcement, the last couple of days, about uh, uh, the big uh, impact of the, the, the Big Ten's recent uh, media rights package? Yeah, with the, with, with, yeah what, does that mean? what does it mean? With the caveat that they haven't formally announced it. Um, okay. Uh, you know, I think it's great. I think it's great for college football. They they made a decision to have three uh, linear broadcast partners in Fox who will principally have the big noon game, CBS who will have the 330 kick, and NBC who will have the, 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 the primetime kick. Mm-hmm. And um, – the more, the more broadcasters, major networks we keep involved in college football, the better it is for everybody mm-hmm. because they're invested. They want to promote the game. They want additional properties. <clears throat> so I think it was a brilliant strategy by Commissioner Warren. I think it played out marvelously for him. The timing could not have been better. And I think when they finally announce the number, it will be a pretty, pretty amazing one. But it's also perfect for Notre Dame. Um, we, we, we need NBC to have more college football mm-hmm. to more effectively promote our games and to talk about our games and to have NBC be seen in that light. So that was, that was great for us that they got a big piece of this. What, what is the, is there an ideal number Jack for the college football playoff um, expansion? It, 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 do we want to, well, I was, I was, yeah. Couldn't have been more vested in the model of 12 that we came forward with. I spent a lot of time building that with Commissioner Sankey and, and Bowlesby and Thompson. We spent 18 months on that plan. And I think, it, I think it's the right number for a host of reasons. The calendar is so tough to accommodate. And, and you get bigger than 12, the calendar gets more, even more complicated. And less than 12, I don't, I don't, you're just not giving enough student athletes the opportunity. Mm -hmm. The most compelling statistic for me when we started our research in this was that on average, if you're a college athlete, you have a 23% chance of participating in the postseason. If you're a football player, you have a less than 4% chance. Wow. We we need to give student athletes who are football players more of an opportunity to be in the postseason. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so beyond conference right, realignment and media rights packages, um, the other dizzying issue for the average fan out there is name, image, and likeness. Um, I know you like to refer to it here at Notre Dame is name, image, likeness, and uh, idea, and uh, idea generation, et cetera, which, is, uh, which I think is wonderful for our student athletes to, to think more broadly about that. Give us a sense of the landscape. Um, what is happening here? 
Um, what do you see as some governing body emerging and bringing some kind of regulatory uh, um, sense to, to what's going on? Well, you, you started your question by saying it was dizzying for the fans. It's dizzying for the ADs too. Um, it's a mess. We've, we've, we as college athletics have completely screwed this up. Um, the intention, and we were the first university to speak out in favor of name, image, and likeness and ideas. The intention was to put student athletes in a position that every other student at Notre Dame enjoys, which is they can benefit from their name, image, likeness, and ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the musician can play at a club on the weekend. The artist can sell art. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do any anything. Even those things you couldn't do if you were a student athlete. Hmm. Um, and so we, we supported it. What we never anticipated was that it would come online with no regulation. And it would come online coupled with the unlimited right to transfer. Mm -hmm. And it's, cre it's created an untenable situation, frankly, where most of what's going on under the name of name, image, and likeness has nothing to do with name, image, and likeness. They are not commercial transactions where I am rewarding you for something great you've built or the fact you've got 5 million followers on your social media website. They are talent acquisition fees mm -hmm. where I'm paying you to, to come to our school. Mm -hmm. And we have to find a way to get away from that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, any hope that we're any hope that we're moving in that direction? Not much. Um, it's a little hard to see a way forward where Congress isn't involved. Mm -hmm. um, the NCA is so gun shy about antitrust lawsuits right now for good reason. They've lost all of them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot of discussion with Congress, interest in Congress, but you know, we all understand the challenges of getting congressional action these days. So it's tough when you're, you're probably your most promising solution is also one that's so remote. So I think we're going to have a couple of more years of this absolute mess. The way we deal with it is to continue to talk about the things we've always talked about and to, to offer a very different proposition than most schools are. Um, if you're not interested in getting a great education, if you're not interested in being part of a community where you meet other students, um, if you're only interested in, you know, the, the, the transactional side of your experience, this isn't the right place for you. And we have found the more we stress that distinctive, distinctiveness, the more we talk about it, the better off we are. And, and to that end, um, Marcus Freeman has been the poster child for um, recruiting and not only um, student athletes, but also the coaching staff, uh, the six hires that he's made since taking over as the head football coach. He's found a way to genuinely speak about Notre Dame's distinctive characteristics and the value that that can add to the lives of young people over the next, uh, you know, 40, 60 years of their lives. Um, Tell us a little bit, I mean, uh, the recruiting class right now, uh, currently ranked number one in the nation for 2023 football recruits, and also ranked number one in the nation uh, for the 2024 recruits. All the while NIL is going on, and these talent acquisition fees are there. Um, is this sustainable? Um, how is he doing this? Give us a little insight into the culture there. Well, part of it is, to be clear, we're we're supporting true NIL activity, right? So we want to create opportunities for our student athletes to benefit, yeah. and and we're we're engaged in that. We've got a team of people working on it, but but they're true commercial activities based on real value, um, mm -hmm. and and that's good. <clears throat> but we are we are focusing on the broader picture and. Mm -hmm. and our greatest asset is to talk about the success of our student athlete alum, alumni. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can point to people who have played football here at Notre Dame who are doing unbelievably thing, unbelievable things right now, having great success in their professional lives. And that's the essence of the conversation. Which of these looks better to you now? The, the, 
the payment someone's offering you to come to school with no promise of anything else be it beyond that, or the opportunity to become a CEO mm -hmm. um, or a, a leader in governance or a doctor or whatever it is you may want to pursue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's been central to, to our notion. It is for, for forever. Yeah. And the only way you can take advantage of that is if you, if you go to a place that develops all the skills you need and empowers you, it doesn't, it doesn't deliver it to you. Yeah. It empowers you to, to have those benefits and reap those rewards. Yeah. That's a great way to frame it for, for forever. Uh, you come here for four years and the benefits uh, will be with you forever. And uh, so, so tell us, you've had a chance to observe, I would we have like four or five practices in the book so far uh, for the upcoming football season. Uh, there's so much enthusiasm. There's so much energy. Uh, people are so feel so good about the culture uh, that Marcus and and uh, and his team have created. Um, what are you seeing? What's your sense? And I saw on the college uh, coaches football rankings, um, they rank this as high as fifth, and other rankings are still coming in. Uh, is uh, is this level of of enthusiasm justified? Where where do we stand? Well, you know. The AD who built the schedule that starts at number one or number two Ohio State should be <laughs> should be brought in to explain all of that. Um, so there, there are huge challenges ahead for us. But the things I'm looking for when I'm at those practices, and not just football, at all the practices, I see so clearly at these football practices. I mean, do I see team leadership, right? Do I see student athletes given the freedom to take control of the activities and meeting their fellow students. And, and that is so apparent at our football practices. Do I see a coaching staff of great teachers who like working with each other? I think this is the most cohesive football coaching staff that we've had in my 14 years. Mm -hmm. Great coaches who like working together um, and spend a lot of time sharing ideas and making the team better. Yeah. And then do you have somebody at the head of the program that everyone looks to that, that commands the respect, but also sets the st strategic vision for the program? And Marcus is as good at, the, at that as anyone I've ever been around. Yeah. Um, he is such a great communicator. He's so direct in his style of communication, but he has a great vision of what he wants the program to be. And it never varies. He's so clear about it and is, and, and, bringing those expectations home to the student athletes. Yeah. Um, and, and that produces a great program, mm -hmm. whether you wind up 12 and 0 or eight and four, um, that's a, that has to do with injuries and opponents and everything else. Yeah. But what I, what I'll know either way is that this program is in great shape. Yeah. So, you know, again, kudos on the hire. Um, the thing I, I tell people as I've had a, a chance to spend some time with Marcus, is that you know he's one of those few people that you can say the closer you look, the better he gets, and uh, everything about him just makes you feel better about about the world and better about the program, better about Notre Dame, uh, better about yourself. Just being in his company, is there been anything about him that uh, while you selected him that has surprised you, as you've kind of watched? Is there been anything uh, that you say, wow, I? I I, I didn't know what it was getting in this area. Um, I guess I call it his efficiency, his um, how much he crams into the 19 hours he's awake every day. Um, yeah. he, he is so decisive and so quick to act. And, you know, I've had to learn in my relationship with him that if I make a suggestion, he's likely to act on it. So I better be careful. <laughs> I, I shouldn't suggest it if I don't intend for it to happen within the next 30 minutes. Um, this is never, that's a, never a problem that I've had. I make lots of suggestions. They go nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, so, so, so that's been, that's been delightful. You know, I knew it when I hired him, but the whole dynamic with his family, um, you know, having his kids at practice or in the building as often as they are and him encouraging the other coaches to do the same. Um 
it's just it's it, it's great. It it feels like Notre Dame. Jack, you've said in in previous discussions that one of the toughest parts of your job, and you got so many of them, is football scheduling. And uh, we got we got a couple really exciting Shamrock games on on the horizon this year. Being able to go out to Vegas, play in Raider Stadium, and everything else is um, there's a buzz. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to go out and take in the Shamrock Series game there. And then next August we'll be in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, and. And again, I think we're 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 planning on taking forty five thousand Americans to uh, to the Emerald Island for for that game and all the events around it. Um, anything that you can say about scheduling and and your thoughts about it and and challenges and opportunities? Well, you know, uh, people have heard me say it a hundred times, but if you're going to be independent, be independent. Um, use it. And, yeah. and that's that's what Las Vegas represents. That's what Ireland represents. You know, I hope we can find ways to do more international games. You can only do one every few years, but it'd be great if for every student athlete who stays four years, they have one of those trips. Yeah, um, that 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 would be ideal. Um, and beyond that, you a, a lot of it will be driven by my assessment of what the next seat version of the CFP is right. My hope is always that it'll be a system that places an emphasis on strength of schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we built really hard schedules going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I've made a mistake if we get to a CFP model that doesn't reward that, but I don't think that'll happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to get around the country. Um, we want to touch the Notre Dame community, wherever it is, we want our schedules to be really challenging and we want them to create great experiences for our kids. You know, we're going to go play in Lambeau stadium uh, right. in a few years. That's, that's great for our student athletes. Right. And so we, we played in more NFL stadia than any team in the country. Um, and, and that's just part of the Notre Dame experience. So, um, you know, the, the, the other thing that you did early on in your tenure as you created um, Fighting Irish Media, which I thought, thought was a brilliant stroke. And I remember you talking back in the day, we got to create more of our own content and not just leave that to others. And, uh, and, and they have just scored with one video after another. First of all, announced, capturing Marcus meeting the team when he was announced by uh, our strength and conditioning coach for the very first time. So many moments that have given us a glimpse of, uh, of the character of the program and, and the quality of, of, uh, of the people who make it up. Um, but recently with the Shamrock uh, series reveal in, in Vegas, there was, a, you know, that uniform reveal uh, and, and it was creative, it was fun, it was current. Um, my big question there is, um, why weren't you in it? Um, were, were you left on the cutting room floor? Uh, did you just not fit that fun, current, creative motif? Well, certainly the latter's true. Um, <laughs> and and I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to suffer some overexposure. The, the, I think it's next week that the documentary on Manti um, comes out. And um, I'll have more than a little bit of airtime in that. So um, I'm so glad you brought this up because I'm asked all the time, sort of from a legacy perspective, what do I – what do I point to? And people always think it's going to be Crossroads or Compton or a certain hire. It's fighting Irish media. Um, to build that capacity was so critical. And to be able to do it as effectively as we have has been so important to our overall success in recruiting, in communicating the stories about your values and who you are. If you don't have that capability, uh, you, you fall way behind quickly. Mm -hmm. I am so proud of the fact that that video, the uniform reveal, the parody of hang, the hangover, um, was done 100% by our staff, our, our employees. Mm -hmm. I, one of my children works in an industry where they do things like that. And, and he said minimum half a million dollars to produce that. <clears throat> it cost us the airline tickets um, in a couple of days time, um, yeah. for, 
for our staff to go do that on their own. And I love what Marcus said about it when, when asked about his reaction. He said, I have so much confidence in those people. When they bring me an idea, I just say, okay. I don't, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time. And I'm the same way, you know. They, they said, hey, here's what we're doing. I, I didn't see the script. I didn't. I said, OK, yeah. uh, good luck. And um, it, it's worked so well. And, and we've and, and they've developed a, a trust and a confidence. What I told them during the hiring process when we hired Marcus was film everything. Mm -hmm. Film me and my house on the phone. Film film whatever you can. We'll figure out what we'll use later. Right. Let's film it. And everybody has enough trust in them that we can do that. Yeah. And, and so I couldn't be prouder of their efforts. That's fantastic. You mentioned, uh, you just mentioned the Manti Teo documentary that will air in a week or so. If you, that, that was such a, a, a complex and, and, and difficult uh, episode in, in Notre Dame football history. And, and it happened to such a, a wonderful human being and such an incredible team leader. Um, if you had a chance to preview the documentary and and do you think it's going to be a fair treatment of this complex dynamic? Yeah, I have not previewed it. Um, but the reason we participated and supported it was it this is Manti's opportunity to tell his story. He this is this is being done with his cooperation and his full participation. He has he had the opportunity to review all the materials. And so that's why we're that's why we're participating in it um, and, and have a level of confidence in it. Got it. Great. Well, we look forward to seeing that uh, soon. Um, just a couple of final questions. One is um, and in addition to all the other challenges that you have uh, confronting you as a college athletic director, um, there's a challenge of finances and uh, making all all, all this float. Uh, especially with all the competition that is out there. How are we doing from a financial perspective and what can we do to help? Well, your team is doing a spectacular job. Um, we, we set an all-time record in terms of the Rockney Athletic Fund uh, this year, and that is so critical to us. There are there's so many projects and, and <clears throat> opportunities that the Notre Dame community helps us with that are really important to us financially, but but two that have a special place. One is the Rockney Fund, because those are the funds that allow us to find the, the small margins that are di the difference between winning and losing, mm -hmm. investing in sports science or in some equipment or a piece of apparel that'll make a difference. Mm -hmm. and so that's so important. The other is endowing the scholarships and coaching positions. Mm -hmm. The, the long-term success of Notre Dame athletics is dependent on building its endowment, yeah. as it has been for the university, as Father Hesburgh told us many years ago it would be. And we started way behind in that game. And because of the great work of your team and the support of our community, we've really started to create some momentum around endowing grant and aids and endowing coaching positions. And with all the uncertainty in college athletics, and all we don't know about the future, that's our insurance policy. Mm -hmm. That we've taken the core things, our educators and our students, and we've endowed the cost of having them be part of our program. Mm -hmm. Excellent. One final question, Jack. You know, with all the noise and the confusion and the cacophony of voices that are out there around college ad athletics, why do you still believe in it? Why is it really important for institutes of higher education to invest so much in intercollegiate athletics? First of all, I, I, I'd start by saying it's more important for Notre Dame to do it now than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Because our model, our, our defense of the way you'd like this to happen and our ability to compete at a very high level while doing that is so important today. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate it everybody who comes and cheers for our student athletes or contributes to Rockney or supports us in any way, because it's important. At, at the base level though, I still believe this is the purest form of education you can find. Hmm. It is a small group of students with a dedicated faculty for four to five years, working together, learning, 
And I've yet to have a student athlete come back to campus and visit me, and that happens a lot, who doesn't talk about the influence a coach had on their life. Mm-hmm. If, if you say to anybody who's been a student athlete at Notre Dame, who were your biggest influences? They will inevitably name the coach as the first or second influence. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what we should do. It's the same influence a rector has or a great classroom professor, but there's a special opportunity in athletics because of the length of time you spend together. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to take advantage of that. And the young men and women who have graduated from our athletic programs and gone on to do things that have changed the world are the evidence that proves it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, it's always uh, a pure delight to talk with you. I really appreciate it because there's no questions that you will dodge. You talk about everything, you take it right on. And I I'm really appreciate it. And, and we are grateful for your now going into your 15th year of leadership of Notre Dame Athletics. We're going to need uh, your wisdom and aptitude more than ever, I think, in the next uh, next couple of years. Um, so thank you, Jack. Uh, please join us next Wednesday, same time, noon. We're going to meet with our new provost, uh, John McGreevy. Uh, some of you know him, but you're going to get to hear from him the first time in this new role as our chief academic officer. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to being with you next week on Wednesday. And as we always do, Uh, Please join me and we'll conclude our time together with a prayer to Our Lady, uh, the the figure that that illumines and, and, and guides everything that we do here at this university. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Take care, God bless, and go Irish. Thanks, Thanks, Luke.